So I think, uh, you know, we all get this idea that freedom means uh, kind of, well, a lot of people get the idea that freedom means that I can do whatever I want. And um, in a sense, uh, that's true. But then in, a, in, a, in another sense, uh, some things we do can end up um, actually making us more in bondage. For instance, if somebody does something wrong, then, you know, and it's, it's a negative action, then they're going to end up in jail. And then they're less free than they were before. So some activities that we perform, um, actually, although they may, we may think that, you know, we're free to do these activities, but when we perform them, we actually end up less free than we were originally. Um, and so that's actually the idea of how we came into this world that we're in. That is a place of uh, lots of suffering, um, birth, death, disease, and old age. And uh, I'm not gonna—I promise this. I'm not gonna make this too depressing. <laughs> but, but yeah, this, these activities that we do, these activities and desires that we do. Well, most people would say, "Well, I'm free, and uh, and I, you know, I can do what I want, and I can go where I want." But oftentimes, these same things that we 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 say we're free in doing we end up entangling ourselves more. This is what we call it karma. Um, and so karma is very, um, Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, karma is very intricate. There's so many different levels of things we do and, and how these reactions come to us. Um, and so uh, the, the level of, of being we want to come to is, is coming to the point where uh, we truly can be free. Because we're actually, we're, we are um, con conformed to uh, time, space, and thought in the material world. So if I say I want to meet you at 6.30 at Krishna Cove, um, and, you know, this is material world. Um, there's a lot of instances of, of people who are liberated in the spiritual world that can actually go from planet to planet and they can fly around the universe. And they're not restricted by any of these things. So oftentimes we think we're free, but we're, we're it's very limited. What's our facility for freedom, for instance? Um, can we, if we think about it, can we just go fly? Um, we can fly in an airplane, but can we take off and fly into outer space? And these things, so our, our freedom is based on, you know, the conception of our thought. And so Prabhupada said we can, we can travel to other planets just by thought. So thought's also another limit of uh, what we would call freedom or, uh, or, or, or capacity to, to go places and do things. But the spiritual world is not, it's not there's no uh, time, space, and thought that is constraining our, our actions. So actually, as, as much as people think they're free in this world, uh, we're not really free. This is considered um, a place that's restricting us because no matter what we do in this world, we're going to face uh, threefold miseries. Miseries of the body and mind, uh, miseries from other living entities, and natural calamities. And everybody is uh, facing anxiety and suffering. Uh, suffering is there in the past, behind us, and suffering is there in the future. So someone who is using their intelligence, is they want to know, how can I be free from this um, for good? How can I be free from this for good? And if we have somebody who's under our responsibility, a, a child or a loved one, we want to know this knowledge because this knowledge can help us to act in order to be free from this bondage that we're in. Um, and so, you know, so many animals have so many more capacity than we have, you know. You know, we can't breathe underwater, but, you know, fish can. Uh, uh, so many animals, if you want to sleep six months out of the year, bears can sleep six months out of the year. Um, and we're not in the control, really, of our own bodies. We don't really understand what's going on in our own bodies. We put food in our body, and then it's something that happens, and it all works. <laughs> How does this happen? I, you know, I shaved my face today, and um, in a couple of days, it's going to grow back. I have to shave again. I don't ask for this. This just happens. So, so many things are happening, and we take them for granted. But the control that we have is, is very limited. So, coming to the point where we're not entangled by the karmic reactions anymore, that our actions are not entangling us, but our actions are actually freeing us. 
our actions are enable us to, to see greater things and see with greater vision, see the spiritual world. Uh, we were talking earlier at Laura's house, and this is the kingdom of Maya. We're in the kingdom of Maya, or illusion. Meaning that, um, illusion doesn't mean that it's false. Illusion just means that it's temporary. So temporary in the sense that every minute, every second, our cells are changing. Things are changing every minute. There's instability. So, it, you know, analogy is like a, it's like a dream, or um, which is not false. You really have a dream. You can wake up and tell me maybe about your dream. But at some point, you're going to come to the true reality. So we need we have, the goal of Krishna consciousness, the yoga practice, is to um, act in a way where we're free from. Um, from illusion, from maya, that we can see things the way they are. And with this knowledge, this knowledge, we can act properly and we can help our loved ones to act properly. The knowledge is everything. The knowledge is the beginning. To have this knowledge and know how to act, then we can have the result. If you want to uh, achieve, uh, speak another language, then... She's going to walk Okay. <laughs> She's going to... I'm sorry. <laughs> but if you want to speak another language or you want to uh, go to another country, as you two are, then you, uh, you, you learn. You learn. You take the time to learn because you want to have this experience. You want to be able to engage in that in a higher way. You know, you still have an experience going there, but it's a higher experience once you have this knowledge. You're able to do act properly. If you want to, uh, someone like in the beginning, someone's saying I'm free, but they go do all kinds of nonsense, and the police come and arrest them, and then they're in jail for the rest of their life. Well, they were free for maybe a, a couple months, maybe a week. Um, so we 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 take this knowledge. We understand who we are, self-realization, understanding that I'm a spirit soul. Uh, my soul within me is who I am. And through the, 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 the spiritual practice, we're developing our spiritual soul. Our, soul. our soul is dormant, and we're reawakening it. So it's like when we chant the Maha Mantra, it's like if you're sleeping and somebody whispers in your ear, Dylan, Dylan, Dylan. And then you wake up. You wake up, and then you're like, oh, okay, that was just a dream. See, the Maha Mantra is awakening our spiritual life. And it's like a, a coconut, when it's young, the, the, the fruit of the coconut is sticking to the uh, inside of the coconut. And as the, as the coconut develops and it ripens, then uh, it starts to detach from the sides. And so you can take a mature coconut and you can shake it, and the coconut is within. So it has developed its spiritual life. Initially, it was, it was dormant, but as we develop our spiritual body, the spiritual body within. And we realize that we are spirits. We are spirit soul. And we've been here the whole time, but we haven't been conscious. We've been living thinking that we're something we're not. Meaning that... So Bhagavad Gita tells us who we are. Bhagavad Gita says that you're eternal. Bhagavad Gita says that we, we're eternally... Not just eternal, but we're eternally individual. We've always been individuals. And uh, the soul can't be cut. Um, into pieces. Therefore, uh, for eternity, we have been a distinct living entity for all time, from the past and into the future. So this eliminates so much anxiety. So much anxiety in the material world is that things are changing at every minute. We're losing, we're losing, we're, we can't hold on. We may be a millionaire one day, the next day we're, we lost it all. Someone who stole it, or we didn't know how to spend money, and we went crazy and who knows so um, so we the self-realization is, is so important because if we know who we are then how can we act and then God bless you Hare Krishna <laughs> and so this spiritual practice that we have is so potent and powerful and as I, I initially, I hear this philosophy, and what attracted me was the devotees who were, what I noticed about devotees is they're, they're very sincere people. 
and they weren't just going to give you a quick answer just to make you feel good or something like that. When you had a, when you were truly were seeking, they would hear you and listen to you and try to give you an answer from their heart. And so uh, we have to have faith in a particular person that can guide us. Because if we take, we take truth from our own mind and senses and our own experience, this is the kingdom of mind, of illusion. So every moment we're going to be illusion. And if we try to develop our spiritual life, people are going to try to say, what are you doing? You're crazy. What do you do? Why are you wearing these orange robes? Why are you bowing all the time to, you know, dolls? You know. But somebody, Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, we approach somebody who's seen the truth. Seers of the truth. And so my faith was in the devotees. Really, my faith was that I met these people and I believed they had something. I, I saw, I could see that they were uh, unique. That they were sincere. They would, they would look at you and they would understand, yes, this is, we're not going to lie to you, this is a place of suffering. And until that point, you know, it's honest to say, I don't know, or I'm still searching. We don't, we don't ask people to accept cheaply, we ask people to um, just try to hear, just try to participate in here, and engage in the practice with, at least try the practice. It, try engaging in the practice with sincerity, sincerity of heart. And if the result isn't there, or you don't, you, you don't want it, then that's totally fine. This is something that's experiential. It's something that when you engage in the, in the chanting process, uh, you can feel the spiritual, um, spiritual effect. You can feel the spiritual atmosphere that's created, the spiritual sound vibration. So this name, this holy name, is directly given to us from the spiritual world in order for us to associate with the spirit. And <laughs> so true knowledge is to know what is matter, what is spirit, and uh, who is the controller of both. And I was uh, talking to uh, Pete earlier, and saying that there's a, there's a person behind everything we see. And so the supreme person is Krishna, the all-attractive one, uh, full of six opulences. And we're automatically attracted to him, just like we're attracted to a little baby. He cannot be. He's so sweet, and cute, and beautiful, and innocent. And um, so you can't not be. And just like that, Krishna, you cannot. We are, we are by nature, attracted to Krishna. Krishna is beautiful beyond imagination. When he plays his flute, he can attract anybody in the entire universe. The demigods stop what they're doing and, and just. They're just enamored by it. So we reconnect with the reservoir of all pleasure. Any pleasure we experience. It says in Bhagavad Gita, in, in all respects, I am, the, I, am the, I am the remembrance, the knowledge, and forgetfulness in man. And in all respects, you are following my path. Even if you're following maya, even if you're following illusion, this is still set up for us by Krishna. So, but when we turn to Krishna and we start to cultivate our, our spiritual life and we start to become truly satisfied within, one of the six, six opulences of Krishna is that he's the most renounced, which means that he's satisfied from within and he, he doesn't need anything in order to be satisfied. Simply, he can be by himself. And I've told a story before that when I first was joining the movement, I went out to this field over here, this empty field, and I was chanting on my beads, and it was a Friday night, and I started to experience very high levels of bliss. Krishna was giving me a little bit of taste, and I never experienced this type of bliss before in my life, and that's, I mean, the experiential is why I'm sitting here. I hadn't experienced this type of bliss, and then I thought about it logically that I'm alone, completely alone in an empty field. On a Friday night. What? This doesn't make sense. How am I happy? Why am I blissful? Because it's from within. See? And then the connection with, with God, with Krishna. We Relationship is what we want. We want relationship. Relationship is the highest. Everybody wants relationship. And some people may reject relationship 
because they want to uh, focus on themselves is because they think that simply by uh, building myself up as, as God, for myself being the right most renounced, then I will be happy. But then at some point we realize that actually we are meant for relationship. So developing this relationship with Krishna um, it brings true happiness. <clears throat> But yeah, so, so true freedom is, true freedom means that we have to, there are some regulative principles that we have to follow. Um, there's some things that simply get in the way of us enjoying spiritually. Just like, uh, just like if you get a, uh, you have a, uh, some sort of like scab and you, you itch it, it feels good, and you do it and then it starts bleeding. There's some things that we just can't satisfy because this is going to make us bleed like that. So there's some things that we simply have to renounce. And this practice, this process of renouncing some things that are simply going to lead... Uh, a very exaggerated example of that is taking drugs. Somebody who starts taking drugs, they get habituated, and then they need the drug. See? This is not freedom, this is bondage. They need that drug then. So there's some things that we become habituated to that we think we need. So there's some things we simply can't do. But for the most part, so many things we can do it to please Krishna. We can sing and dance to please Krishna. We can cook food for Krishna and eat wonderful food for Krishna. We can associate and have wonderful relationships with people uh, in relation with Krishna. All these these wonderful things in life. We can go on adventures. We can explore. We can go hiking. We can we can do things. And but we're always remembering Krishna. We have our prayer beads. You know, and instead of just having to uh, fill the silence with uh, some sort of anything that comes to the mind, we can simply be quiet and chant and, and pray to God. And it's really, it's beautiful. And the culture is beautiful. But there's very few people who are really interested in serious spiritual life because this is not a place where people want to be spiritual. This is a place for evolution. And it says in the Bhagavad Gita that one out of a out of thousands of men, one may attain perfection. And out of those, hardly one knows me in truth. It's very rare. It's very rare in this material world. That's why you see this room. I think there's a basketball game going on tonight. Pretty sure, right? Am I right? Okay. Yeah, so I think we're doing really well or something out here. I used to really be into basketball. But um, it's, it's natural. See, it's, we don't say artificially renounce. Some things we have to. Some things, if you are habituated to take drugs, you have to stop because it's just going to kill you. <laughs> it's going to kill you. So some things we say you just have to not do. Because it's just going to hurt you, no matter what. But most things we can do, we can do to satisfy Krishna and, and gain satisfaction, true satisfaction. So, thank you all for coming. And um, do you have any discussion points you want to talk about? or? Anything that you've been thinking about? She's smiling at you. Right? She has a question. <laughs> yeah, she has. I'll try to answer her question. I don't know. <laughs> she looks pretty uh, scholarly. <laughs> so, when, when are you two leaving? Uh, one week for me. One week? Is that Venezuela? Brazil. Brazil. She's wow. from Colombia. Um, wow. So she's going to Colombia and I'm going to Brazil. Where's the okay. The baby. <laughs> the highest bidder. <laughs> um, wow. <laughs> you have family there? In Brazil? No, I have a, a, a grant. Um, it's a kind of a scholarship kind of teaching. Okay. So I'm just nice. trying to get a, a job that helps me travel, because that's what we like to do together. Sweet. That's <laughs> nice. Yeah. Um, you guys are such a nice young couple. You're going to... Such a sweetheart <laughs> baby. So. Thanks, Aaron. She has the best. Don't forget the their sweethearts, too. Yeah, oh, both? Of course, yeah. <laughs> but I, I, I said sweetheart couple. <laughs> Uh, we have a, so there's there's a lot of pizza. <laughs> I'm gonna need some help.
So, uh, but yeah, thank you so much for coming. It was really nice. Thank you. Well, I, I wanted to, to yeah. ask you just yeah. an advice because I get to like very trapped with the baby that mm -hmm. I always uh, think that meditation or uh, my spiritual practice will wait for later. Mm -hmm. And so I know it's very important that I focus on that too, but it's like the material well, world right now with yeah. the of all busy, always busy, yeah. make me think that later I can do my own practice. Well, our, our spiritual master, he said that actually raising children is one of the highest services you can do for Krishna. Yeah. Because it's very, it's not easy at all. It's one of the hardest things you have to raise a child. Um, but yeah. having that responsibility, raising a child and understanding that this is a spirit soul, and that my duty as their parent is to help them become elevated spiritually too. So just by living in a way where you're doing your duty very nicely, you're taking care of your child very nicely, you're taking care of your family very nicely, you're trying to cultivate a spiritual environment for them in your home. You know, you have, like you were doing, you have mantra music, you have the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, you know, the most powerful sound vibration, you have that playing. Um, these, these sort of things. But just know that the duty you're doing, taking care of the child, that in itself is service to Krishna. Very high service. If you're doing it in a way to help this, this spirit soul also become liberated from this place. So that's, that's our goal, is to help, you know, help our, our loved ones become liberated also. That's, the, that's actually the highest welfare work we can do. Wow, thank you. I have a question too. Yeah. I have some beads, and if, when I'm chanting by myself, um, I try and do it in multiples of 108. Do you feel that's important, or if you get interrupted, do you try and finish the 108, or how <laughs> can you speak to that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so there's 108 is a um, very auspicious number because there's 108 chief gopis in the spiritual leela at pastimes, and there's also 180 Panishads, uh, which are Vedic scriptures, and there's other means too. But what I do is, um, me personally, and I've told the devotees this and they say it's okay, so <laughs> is that if I'm like halfway through, I'll just take my beads out and I'll have that bead in front, and I'll lay it there, so I know where I left off. So, it's okay to do like five times 108. I mean, j is there is it multiple of 108? Is that? Yeah. So you have 108 beads on the. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we go around that um, 16 times a day. Okay. Yeah. So with some 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 devotees do more. Some devotees do 32. So it's individual. Yeah. I mean, truly, Prabhupada says standard that we should we should try to do 16 a day. We should do 16 a day. That was just really spiritual practice. That was 16 a day. And it usually takes about, I mean, it takes me about 2 hours and 45 minutes. Usually. So, we do the best we can. We can build up to, you know, we get in the habit if we do maybe a couple a day. And then, as long as you know, we keep it consistent, though. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, we can build it as, as our desire increases. We'll get, we'll, get a little, we'll get a taste for it, you know, it will help us. And then we want to do more. I wanted to comment on what she said because I was experiencing the same thing. Like I'm very busy between work and school and travel time and all that and getting home and being tired and having to cook and all this stuff. And I don't even have a kid. So um, what I did was I made a, I had a, I had a two bedroom apartment and I turned one of the bedrooms into an, a meditation room, a room that I solely dedicated just to Krishna. And so when I'm walking by it, it's always like, Good, instead of me reminding myself, hey, you should chant here. Like, just seeing that temple mm -hmm. room is like a reminder, okay, it's here, I built it, I should come. <laughs> so it helps me out a lot, a lot. It is like a physical reminder, and it draws me into that. And I close the door, and it's like I'm literally in the temple right here. Yeah, I think, I think my beads are everywhere. I always have my beads with me. Because there's always some time, you know, when you just have to chat, you know. There's always maybe 10 minutes where you're waiting, you know, waiting room or something. So there's always opportunities to do it. But it's so nice, you know. So. That's the time. Look, uh, in, I heard that the mornings are better for you to meditate. and okay, Yeah. So if not. Between yeah. 10 and 12. 
Nine and twelve. No, it's four in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but she's sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for me, it's yeah. not. Yeah, you do it when you can, but it is it is easier in the morning. It's more it's more auspicious. Yeah, it's definitely the atmosphere in the morning is the mode, mode of goodness they call it. So it's, yeah, it's easier to chant in the morning. But you know, if you can't do it in the morning, then you just do it whenever you can. You know. The good thing is just the consistency, though. If you can keep consistency. And then it just becomes a habit. Everything becomes a habit. We can develop these good habits. And chanting is the best habit you can have because all other good qualities come from chanting.